And I put at the top of your notes, which hopefully you received when you came in uh, today on the bulletin, on the back there, you'll see John chapter one, verse five. So remember, John was a disciple of Jesus, a very close disciple of Jesus, who wrote the book of 1 John that we studied this fall. And this verse is from his account of Jesus' coming. And he starts at the very beginning talking about how Jesus came to bring light to the world. And he says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And I put this verse at the top of your notes because it is a perfect lead in to Revelation chapter one, another book that John wrote. And this chapter, specifically the second half of this chapter, paints what is quite possibly the most majestic portrait of Jesus that has ever been written down on paper. And the whole picture revolves around light in darkness. So get the picture. Whenever we study the Bible, we need to start by stepping into the shoes of the first people who read a particular text. So I want you to imagine right now, wherever you're sitting, imagine you're a Christian in the Roman Empire in the first century. This would not have been an easy time for you. Because you are a follower of Jesus, you face danger on every side. Jewish persecution from the Jewish establishment, persecution from the Roman government. Imagine that you have members of your church, maybe even some members of your family who are imprisoned right now in dark dungeons. Others you've seen hung on crosses or thrown before wild beasts. People you know from your church have been beheaded. So you get this letter from John, a follower, a close friend of Jesus who is now exiled to an island because of his faith. And there you sit, daily facing pressure to bow down and worship the Roman emperor, knowing that if you don't, you may lose your job, and with it, your ability to support your family. You may lose your family, or you may lose your life. And all inclinations are pointing to things getting worse, not better. And it's all because you're a follower of Jesus. So think about it even back in our shoes right now. Have you ever followed Jesus? Or maybe even just taken a big step of faith in your life and all of a sudden things got worse for you, not better. The kind of thing causes you to question your faith. Put yourself back in the shoes of those folks in the first century it's pretty tempting to compromise your faith or at least just tone it back. Try not to make a big deal out of your faith. These were dark days for men, women, and children who were reading the book of Revelation, which is what I love about how John starts the second half of this chapter in verse nine. So follow along with me. He says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus. Don't you love that? I, John, your brother, your partner in tribulation and patient endurance. In other words, John is saying to these Christians in dark days, like we, we are family. I'm your brother over here. We're, we're family together. This is not easy, but none of us is alone. We are partners together in tribulation, helping each other patiently endure. You know, as I was reading, studying, meditating on this passage this week, I, uh, I just couldn't help at this point and, and for this reason want to pause for a moment here in this text and just say personally how thankful I am to be a part of this family called McLean Bible Church. It was two years ago tomorrow night on Christmas Eve that I got pulled over by the Secret Service in front of the White House for running a red light and uh, on Constitution Avenue there, ended up having a conversation with one of the agents about McLean Bible Church in a weird chain of events that led me, led to me eventually coming here. And I just want to, I was just thanking God that I ran that red light. Uh, I don't know exactly how that works theologically, although I still maintain it was yellow. But uh, <laughs> I, uh, I just, 
just thinking about the picture family here, and I just, I praise God for the brothers and sisters in this family, which is what we are as a church, and for the opportunity for me personally, for my family to be a part of this family. I had taken one of my kids uh, out last week for lunch, and I just asked him, I said, hey buddy, since we moved here, what's been the best thing and what's been the hardest thing? And the best thing he said, the first thing that came out of his mouth, he said, McLean Bible Church. I, I said, yeah. I certain my heart just left when he said, I said, well, what is it about the church that you like most? And I thought he might say some program or activity. He said, the people. He, he, he said, I just really love the people at McLean Bible Church. And you know, I, I was thinking all month long, we've been talking about one in December and really challenging each other to give. We camped out on, on that a good bit last week. I really wanna encourage you based on that word just to give as we come to the end of this year. We have a good ways to go in light of what we have the opportunity to do here and around the world. But I wanna, I wanna encourage you to give, not just for the sake of Yemen or Title I school communities where, work, where we're working all across the DMV like we talked about last week. I wanna encourage you to give because this is what, families do, so Dale and, uh, and DJ and Thomas who lead worship here at Tyson, Tyson's made some visits this week to some of our family in the church who are facing particular needs and I just wanna give you a glimpse into one of those visits as a picture of the kind of family uh, that God created us to be, uh, especially amidst dark days. So watch this with me. Okay, so uh, first house is uh, a great family from our church, uh, Louise and Lizette, and Jonathan and Joy. They um, uh, are wonderful friends, and Lizette uh, has been diagnosed with cancer and just had surgery, had major surgery. They thought they were going to get it all, but they found out instead she's going to need five months worth of chemotherapy, very intense chemotherapy. And so she's just losing her hair. She's just going through all the uh, sickness that goes with it. And uh, so we want to stop by and cheer them up a little bit. Um, they are really struggling financially with this because she is obviously not able to work. And now uh, his work has slowed down as well uh, for these last uh, little while. So we're going to try to help them out some as a church. And I know just like our church family would want us to. So uh, come on in and meet Louise and Lizette. The chemo, I received the medicine. So mm -hmm. it's processing my body for seven days. So today I feel much better. But what I, God has been doing is through his word. Mm -hmm. That's my foundation. Mm -hmm. That is a, give me, my spirit is stronger because this is the flesh. Mm -hmm. So what I'm learning now, this is a flesh is gonna mm -hmm. stay. This is the air, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. natural mm -hmm. flesh. So the, really lives in me is the spirit. That's mm -hmm. what I, I know that I look different, mm -hmm. but it doesn't affect me mm -hmm. because my real life is in my spirit. Mm -hmm. So the world is in my brain coming and more fresh mm -hmm. and more clear. So that's what I keep in me going through this process because thank God on time they find everything the doctors has been doing so good. Mm -hmm. So they remove everything, but I'm learning how God is faithful to His work. That foundation is here. Okay, so right. we have just a, a little gift we want to help out a little bit. So with everything that's going on, uh, the church wants to pay your rent for the next uh, four months. So oh. during the time that you're going through all this chemotherapy and everything, try to try to lower the pressure just a little bit for you, you know? Oh. So. Oh, how are you doing? Yes. What's going on? Louise, this is, this is the wet, this is the this is you know, Louise. You remember me? Yes, sir. That's right. I remember. Yeah. You got to sing one song. Oh, okay. If, if you're going to sing, we have an extra guitar for you. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. There it is. Right. Hey, yes. I'm Thomas Key. So nice to meet you. Good to see you again, my brother. God bless you. So, Man. so I had to bring, I told him, uh, you guys are always working real hard, didn't I say? Yes. They're always working very hard. <laughs> yes. I told him actually you stayed home in bed all week, so oh, I, was trying, I was trying to get you to do something other than something. <laughs> Just 
So, church family, this is Lizette and Luis, and uh, I, uh, I just wish uh, you all could have uh, the few minutes uh, that I've had the privilege of having, just any minutes, if you can only have a few minutes to sit down and just hear from this brother and sister, and uh, we were just talking in the back. Uh, as Lizette was just saying, I just, I, I, I find myself growing so much closer to Jesus in the middle of this, like she's in the middle of treatments, just the beginning of five months of a marathon, and she said, Jesus is my life, and uh, death is a win too. So, uh, I mean, she's just quoting Philippians chapter one, and uh, so we, we praise God for you guys, for what you mean to our church, and, uh, and we wanna pray for you. Can we do that? So, will you just join me in praying for them, God? Our Father in heaven, we come to you as brothers and sisters, as your sons and daughters right now, and we pray for our sister and our brother as they're walking through challenging days, and we pray that you would continue to show your grace, your power, your love, your mercy, your strength, your peace to them on their behalf amidst every bit of this journey of patient endurance. God, we pray that you would sustain them and satisfy them every step of the way. God, I praise you even for how uh, you're using this in their family already to point people to Jesus, how you're using them right now to point us to Jesus. Uh, we just pray for your blessings on Luis and Lizette, and we pray that you would glorify yourself. We pray for her healing, we pray for her healing, we pray that you would physically bring her to health and healing. At the same time, we praise you for her confident trust in you, and we pray that more than anything, you would glorify yourself through this journey that they find themselves on, and use it, we pray, for their good and the good of many others. We pray for our brother and sister before you, our Father in heaven, in Jesus' name, amen. Would you thank God with me for the reason I love you guys. Like the church is designed to be not just a place where we come and sit next to each other during the week. It's designed to be a family where we share life together and all that life involves. It's good to be a part of this family. So, all right, back to the text. So how do you encourage each other as family when you're walking through hard times? Like how do you encourage each other as family when things look dark all around you? Well, here's what John does under the inspiration of God's spirit. So follow with me in verse 10. He writes, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. So John is told to write a letter to these churches that are spread throughout the Roman Empire. So then he says in verse 12, I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. Now think about that with me. What's the purpose of a lampstand? To give what? Light, right? So in the middle of dark days, I turned and I saw seven golden lights, lampstands, verse 13. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. This is a 
vision of Jesus and John is overwhelmed, he says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Oh, what does all this mean? I, I, I've heard it said that Revelation is the book of the Bible that people most want to hear taught because they don't understand it. And then I've heard it said that Revelation is the book of the Bible that preachers least want to teach because they don't understand it either. <laughs> There's so much imagery here. But I want, I want to show you. So, especially here at Christmas, like, we think about this picture of Jesus as the baby in a manger. I want to give you another picture to put at the forefront of your mind this Christmas. I want to show you in what we just read, 20 characteristics of Jesus that lead to two massive takeaways for us. Now, if you're any good at math, that's a total of how many points? 22. And you're thinking, I'd like to have lunch at some point, and I get it, me too. So we're going to go pretty quick here, and I just want you to see who Jesus is. Maybe for those of you who are exploring Christianity, to see Jesus for the first time today for who he is. I've prayed that God would open your eyes to see Jesus for who he is the first time. And then for those of you who may have been Christians for years, for decades even, to understand in a deeper way today who he is because his greatness is inexhaustible and in a sense indescribable. I mean, just think about John's assignment here in verse 11, this voice like a trumpet booms behind him and says, write what you see in a book. That's not an easy thing to do. Like it's one thing to write down words that you hear. It's a whole other thing to write down in words the wonder of what you see with your eyes. It's like, imagine you have a pen and a piece of paper. Somebody says, write down what you see in the Grand Canyon. And you look at your pen and paper and you look at the Grand Canyon you think there's no way to put on here the grandeur of what I see out there. So that's what John's trying to to do. So feel the difficulty of his task as he turns and he sees the voice. How do you see a voice? He sees the voice of the one who's speaking to him and he attempts to describe him in words. He is like a son of man. So characteristic number one, Jesus is fully human. Jesus is fully human. Just imagine John's perspective. He had spent three years with Jesus on the earth, every day, walking together, talking together, eating together. Then after three years, he had seen Jesus brutally slaughtered on a cross. Then three days later, he had risen from the grave, ascended into heaven. That's the last glimpse John had of Jesus. So now he turns. It's like around Christmas time, maybe you see family members you haven't seen in a while. Maybe they look a little different. He turns, he sees Jesus again. He's fully man and fully God. Fully God. So all throughout this picture, we see links between Jesus and God the Father. Earlier in Revelation 1, God had spoken and said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Now Jesus speaks and says, I am the first and the last. Jesus is God. There's so many allusions here in this passage and all over Revelation to pictures in the Old Testament. I wish we had time to look at them all even in this passage, but if you want to, you might just write these down. So Daniel 7 describes God as the ancient of days, whose clothing is as white as snow, whose hair is like pure wool. So that's the description of God in Daniel 7. Here it's the description of Jesus. John is describing Jesus in terms in the Bible that are only used for God. Jesus is fully man, he is fully God. Jesus is the fulfillment of centuries of prophecy. So you might write down not just Daniel 7, but Daniel 10. In both of those prophetic passages in the Old Testament, we see a vision of a son of man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold around his waist, with eyes like flaming torches, with arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, whose voice echoes like the sound of a multitude. This is a picture in Daniel 7 and 10 of son of man who's ushering in the kingdom of God. And so now we see it. This is who Jesus is. Just has been prophesied 
prophesied centuries before. So realize, these images are not John's answer to the question, well, what kind of fashion style does Jesus have in heaven? Like, what does he wear? Where does he shop? That's not what John is answering. These are images that have been familiar to John's readers, images that would have triggered in their minds the words of prophets, images that would have evoked in their hearts awe and wonder at a vision of the one the Bible was speaking about for centuries before, 300 specific references over 1,000 years to the coming of Jesus, down to where he would be born, the circumstances that would surround his birth, his life, and his death, which leads to the next characteristic, number four, and Jesus is the final and ultimate sacrifice for sin. Fulfillment of prophecy, final sacrifice for sin, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. Six of the seven times a long robe like this is mentioned in the Old Testament, it refers to the clothing of the high priest who would enter into the most holy place to offer sacrifices for the sins of God's people. So Jesus here is pictured as the one who entered into the presence of God the Father and has offered full and final, once and for all, sacrifice for the sins of God's people. If you are exploring Christianity, this is the essence of why Jesus came. We have all sinned against God we are all separated from God, and if we die in our sins, separated from God, we will be separated from God forever. But Jesus came to offer his life as a sacrifice for our sin. That's why he died on the cross. That's what he was doing. He had no sin to die for, but he chose to die for our sin, for your sin, for my sin, so that when we trust in and follow Jesus, his ultimate sacrifice covers over all of our sin. Jesus is the final and ultimate sacrifice for sin. Your sin, all your sin against God can be completely covered by the sacrifice of Jesus on a cross. Number five, Jesus is infinitely old. The hairs of his head are white, like white wool, like snow. That is a deliberate picture, biblically, of age. Like I mentioned a minute ago, this is the description Daniel gives of God as the ancient of days in Daniel 7. Now it is applied to Jesus because Jesus has existed forever. He did not begin. He has always been He's infinitely old. He is infinitely wise. In ancient culture, white hair was a symbol of accumulated wisdom through years of experience. The experience and wisdom of Jesus knows no end. Which leads to number seven. Jesus sees all things. His eyes are like a flame of fire. Nothing escapes his gaze. He sees it all. He sees through it all. Jesus sees through all the pretense. He searches every area of our hearts. He sees the purity of our hearts and he sees the stains in our hearts. Jesus sees everything we would like to hide. Nothing in your life or my life escapes the pure and penetrating gaze of Jesus. Which means Jesus knows all things so this, images, this image of Jesus' eyes like fire reappears in the letter to Thyatira in Revelation chapter two where Jesus says, I know everything about you. Jesus knows everything, including everything about you. Better than you know about you and me. Number nine, Jesus' purity has no error No error. His feet are like burnished bronze, bronze metal, would have purified in a furnace, so my glow in purity. Jesus is absolutely pure. His purity has no error, and Jesus' power knows no equal. Burnished with bronze is also a picture of glory and might and strength. Number 11, you hanging with me? Halfway there? Jesus' voice resounds with authority. First, his voice was like a trumpet. Now, it's like the roar of many waters. What imagery. And from his mouth, so get this picture, from his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword. So see, it's double edge. On one side, this is number 12, Jesus declares eternal salvation. 
Jesus declares eternal salvation for all who trust in him. All who trust in him, Jesus declares, you are saved from your sin. At the same time, Jesus decrees final judgment for all who turn from him. Later in Revelation chapter 19, we will see Jesus at the final judgment. And the Bible says, from his mouth, come a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. Jesus is the judge whose declaration finally and forever decides your fate and my fate. Let me say that one more time. Jesus is the judge whose declaration, whose decree finally and forever decides your fate, my fate. His voice resounds with authority and his face radiates with light like the sun shining in full strength. You don't look up into the light of the sun. It's a picture of radiating light, which causes John to fall on his face as though dead. But Jesus, so imagine this. Jesus lays his right hand on John and says these words. He says, fear not. I am the first. Jesus had the first word in creation, Colossians 1. By him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. Jesus is before all things and in him all things hold together. Jesus had the first word in creation and Jesus will have the last word in creation. Jesus will fully and finally usher in new creation. Jesus is the force behind all of human history. He alone is able to bring the divine purposes to pass because he has conquered. You see, Jesus was dead for a time. I love this. Jesus says, I died. For most, that's like the period at the end of the story, but that's not the case here. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. Jesus was dead for a time, but now, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is alive for all time. He is the living one who will never, ever die again. <laughs> Side note here, did you know one of the best-selling, supposedly Christian books of the past 10, 20 years was titled Heaven is For Real? A fanciful account of heaven told by a four-year-old boy Talks about how he got a halo and wings, but he didn't like them because they were too small. Claims that he sat on Jesus' lap while angels sang to him. He even met the Holy Spirit, whom he described as, quote, kind of blue. Over seven million copies sold. Not to be confused with another book entitled The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven, another bestseller by a man named Kevin Malarkey. Malarkey's son claimed to see Satan many times, described him as having a funny-looking mouth and a few moldy teeth, funny-looking mouth and a few moldy teeth, no noticeable ears, two bony arms and two bony legs. These books, not to be confused in the Christian bookstore with My Journey to Heaven, What I Saw and How It Changed My Life by Marvin, Marvin Bestman, Flight to Heaven by Dale Black, To Heaven and Back, A True Story by Mary Neal, 90 Minutes in Heaven by Don, not John, Piper, Nine Days in Heaven by Dennis Prince. 23 Minutes in Hell, that's a different twist, by Bill Weiss. Make no mistake, there is money to be made in peddling fiction about the afterlife as nonfiction in the world of Christianity today. These books, to be clear, are written by sinful people just like you and me who will die, who will all succumb to death one day. Why listen to them when we have the words of the king who has conquered death for all time? Uh, so <laughs> let me free you, and hopefully these are not in stocking stuffers that you have purchased for anyone this Christmas. If so, take them out, <laughs> take them out, and give them this instead. Jesus was dead for a time. He is alive for all time, which means, number 19, death is controlled by Jesus. 
He has the keys of death in Hades. Keys, a symbol of authority in Jewish thought. Jesus says, I have authority over death. I speak and death listens. I speak and death obeys. And because Jesus has authority over death, he has the ability to turn it into gain for you and for me. This is why Lizette, we're talking back there with a smile on her face. She's like, I have nothing to fear. Because Jesus holds death in his hands. Praise God. Death is controlled by Jesus, which all leads to number 20. No one or nothing compares to Jesus. No one, nothing in all of the history of the world compares to Jesus. Again, if you're exploring Christianity, I challenge you to consider anyone who even comes close to comparing with Jesus. You say, well, how do you compare religious teachers or leaders? I would encourage you to start with the question, who else has defeated the grave? Ladies and gentlemen, there is no one like Jesus. Fully human, fully God. The fulfillment of centuries of prophecy, the final and ultimate sacrifice for sin. Infinitely old, infinitely wise, who sees all things, who knows all things, whose purity has no error, whose power knows no equal, whose voice resounds with authority declaring eternal salvation and final judgment, whose face radiates with light, the one with the first and last word in creation, who was dead for a time and who is alive for all time and rules over death itself. There is no one like him, which leads to, so, two massive takeaways for every one of us. In this room right now, at every campus, from the youngest to the oldest, like right where you are sitting right now, two days before Christmas, two takeaways, two ways to respond, because every one of us who's listening, seeing this picture right now, has a choice for how we're going to respond. So two, two takeaways. One, fall down in worship before Jesus. I urge you not to yawn in the face of Revelation 1 and move on with the busyness of your day and your life. I urge you to fall down in worship to every person within the sound of my voice. See the gulf of grandeur and glory that separates you from Jesus and fall on your face at his feet specifically. If you are not a follower of Jesus, I would say to you, have much fear. Have much fear. And here's what I mean by that. If you are not a follower of Jesus, if you have not trusted in who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for you on the cross, if you are separated from God in your sin and have not turned to this Jesus as Savior and Lord of your life, then you have much reason to fear today. And you will Meet Jesus one day as either Savior or Judge. And that day could be today for any one of us. Not one of us is guaranteed tomorrow. Or he may come back before we get to Christmas. Great. So, None of us guaranteed tomorrow, so I urge you to worship him today. The Bible teaches that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So the question is not, will you bow? The question is, will you bow now or will you bow when it is too late? I urge you to trust in Jesus today, like right now in your heart. I've prayed for this moment, like specifically for those who, for anyone who does not know for sure that if you were to die now, would would you spend eternity in heaven? If you do not know, like absolutely, I know I would through my faith in Jesus, I'm trusting in Jesus, and I invite you to trust in him now. I was I was speaking at this faith day at Nationals Park a couple months ago and 
one of the leaders of the event just said to me, well, I just, I hope we don't talk about judgment or hell or anything like that. And I, I, I get what you're saying. Like, I mean, who, who wants to come to like, it's like Christmas time. Why don't we even talk, talk about judgment and hell? Like, or your baseball game. Why do you want? But here's the deal. Just imagine for a moment. It's true. <laughs> Like that Jesus is the judge and eternity is dependent on how you respond to him. If that's true, then certainly you want somebody to say something about that. And we don't pretend like that's not really, like, well, it doesn't feel popular. Like, it doesn't matter how it feels. If it's true, like, we want to know that. And I just want to encourage you. Like, this is the Bible speaking loud and clear. God has brought you here right now to hear this news loud and clear. Your eternity hinges on how you respond to Jesus. I urge you. He loves you. He has offered sacrifice for your sin. He's made a way for you to be forgiven of all your sin, reconciled to God forever. I urge you, trust in him today. If you're not a follower of Jesus, have much fear. But for all who have trusted in Jesus, for all who trust in Jesus today, if you are a follower of Jesus, have no fear. I have no fear. And we, we've talked about this, about how as we've surveyed, even in our church, like some of the struggles that most people have, like at the top of the list is fear in so many different ways. And so here's why I just want us to hear what the Bible's saying here. I'm just a picture of Jesus putting his hand on John's shoulder saying, do not fear. And listen, just get the picture of what's happening in this passage. It's like you have these lampstands, these stars. What does this mean? Well, John tells us that Jesus is standing in the middle of these lampstands and the seven golden lampstands symbolize the seven churches that John is writing to. So churches that are filled with Christians who are going through dark days. So where is Jesus while all of that's happening? He's right in the middle of them. And he's holding seven stars in his right hand, which are the angels, he says, of the seven churches. So the angels who in some way represent these churches. So the picture is Jesus holding them in his right hand, protecting them in the midst of all they're going through. And he's using these churches for a purpose. Remember, the point of a lampstand is to provide what? Light. So see it. The Bible is teaching. God is saying right now to men and women, to going through all kinds of things in your life, in your work, in your family, this world, needing patient endurance, needing grace to go on, needing wisdom, needing peace, all these things. Jesus is saying in the middle of it all to you right now, have no fear. Why? Because Jesus is present with you. Get this, this Jesus, with all 20 of these characteristics, this Jesus is with you. No matter what you're going through right now, what you will go through in 2019, know this, Jesus is not, not distant from you. He's not just over you. Jesus is right there with you in the middle of dark days in a dark world. You are never alone. You're never alone. Jesus is present with you. And Jesus possesses you. He holds you in his hands. And Jesus protects you. Feel his protecting power in a world of tribulation and trial and hurt and heartache and sin and suffering. Jesus is your protector. And ultimately, Jesus has a purpose for you. He has a purpose for you to shine light in greater Washington, D.C., in your life, in your work, in your family, amidst neighborhoods, amidst offices, and amidst schools and communities all across the DMV. I swear, I just want to encourage you here at other campuses, like tomorrow especially, as we celebrate Christmas Eve and all of our campuses, and the gospel will be crystal clear. I can invite people who, who are around you, friends, family members, coworkers who don't know the gospel, like come to one of these gatherings Pray that God would open their eyes to see the love of Jesus for them. See Christmas as not just a holiday to be observed, to see Christ as a king to be praised and loved and worshiped for all of eternity. This is why we're here. Jesus has a purpose for us to shine light in greater Washington, D.C. and to shine light among the nations in Yemen and Ethiopia and West Africa and East Asia and 
all kinds of different ways. This is why we exist as a church. So fall down and worship and then rise up as witnesses. Jesus says, John, rise up and write down what you have seen. Now, obviously, we are not writing a Bible book today, but we have much to tell. So let's tell others about who Jesus is with a heart and mind that are captivated by his glory. Huh. May we never cease to be amazed by the magnificence of Jesus. May we never tire of gazing upon his glory. May his glory continually captivate our imagination and overflow into our proclamation as we give our lives on a passionate mission to proclaim his gospel, to proclaim the light of Jesus in a world of darkness. I give you the portrait of Jesus in Revelation chapter one. So as you reflect on a baby in a manger, ref reflect on these 20 characteristics as well. So let's pray. Oh God, uh, I'm just overwhelmed by this moment. We've just seen this picture of Jesus in Revelation 1. And every one of us, including myself, we all have a a choice right now for how we're gonna to respond to it. God, please, please, please keep us from yawning and moving on with the busyness of our days and all the activities of this week. Please, oh God, keep us from giving a tip of the hat to Jesus. Keep us from a, just a, a religious, monotonous routine that says we'll, we'll give Jesus nominal adherence or casual attention once a week. Jesus, you are worthy of so much more. You are worthy of our lives. You're worthy of all our worship, all our praise, all our adoration. And you, we trust. We praise you. We glorify you. So help us, God. Help us, we pray, to fall down and worship. God, I pray that even, even some who are here who may have been going to church for decades, like that today might be the day where they see Jesus in a fresh way, maybe for the, really the, for the first time and say, I trust in Jesus. I want to live my life in the worship of Jesus. God, I pray that you would cause that to happen. God, I pray for some who are, who are just exploring Christianity, maybe even coming to church for the very first time. God, I pray, I pray that this moment they might see Jesus. They might see your love for them. They might put their faith in Jesus. God, I just pray, I pray that right now you might shape, change the trajectory of lives for eternity. With the power of your word, what we've just seen. And then, oh God, for all who've put their trust in you, God, help us, help us to grow in our uh, awe and amazement at the glory of Jesus. And help us to grow in the surrender of our lives and our trust in Jesus amidst all the things we go through in a, a dark world. Jesus, we praise you as the light that overcomes the darkness. We exalt you for all of the characteristics we have seen in your word today. In your name we pray. Amen.